aromatic ring, um, we're just looking at benzene, but potentially has <coughs> some constituents on it. And you can add to this aromatic ring, okay? It can act as a nucleophile, but the key to this acting as a nucleophile is you need a really strong electrophile to want to add onto that ring, okay? Um, so an aromatic ring is not going to be as reactive as an alkene. You need the, just the right conditions to make, make this happen, all right? So, so far up till now, we've kind of just said, don't worry about the aromatic ring, nothing's going to happen there because it's not um, super reactive in general conditions. But if you set it up to make it really reactive, it can react, all right? So you want to have a super good electrophile that's going to add to that ring. And if you do, and so something that helps with that is having a LA is a Lewis acid. You can add a group on to your aromatic ring. So in this case, we're going to be looking at alkylation. Okay. But we could add an R group to our aromatic ring. Um, so in experiment 14, we're going to use a Lewis acid. The Lewis acid helps us make our electrophile really electrophilic. Okay. We're going to generate a full carbocation. So not just looking at partial positive charge, partial negative charge. We're going to generate a carbocation out of our alkyl group in order to get that to react on the aromatic ring. All right. So you need, like I said, super electrophilic conditions, which positive charge is going to be pretty electrophilic. So in this example, this is the example that Murray gives you, okay, of a friedel crafts alkylation reaction. We'd start here with 2-chloropropane. We react it with aluminum chloride and when we um, react it with the aluminum chloride, we get our secondary carbocation, and then AlCl4 minus is our counter, counter ion to that carbocation, because okay, we've got full positive charge there. Um, now, what is happening with that is in that intermediate point, we've got. It's not like there's a little bit of a coordination that has to happen between the aluminum chloride and our um, halogen on our alkyl group. So what it does is we've got kind of a partial positive charge at first over our secondary carbon here. And that's kind of coordinated with this partial negative charge. Um, of the chlorine that's then trying to coordinate with the aluminum chloride. Okay? So you kind of have to have this in between where we get this coordination of the chlorine to the aluminum, but in between we've got a partial positive here, a partial negative. I'll draw this so it doesn't look like sulfur minus here. Of the chlorine. Okay. Eventually, what you get to then is the carbocation and the AlCl4 minus. Okay. We need that carbocation to then go on and do the reaction. So we'll take the electron density of our aromatic ring, react it with our carbocation. Now, what we get is this intermediate here. Okay. And that intermediate is important the way it sets up because it helps determine what kind of chemistry happens. So in a little bit, we'll show a little bit more with what's going on with this carbocation that's being generated on the aromatic ring. So we're saying that at some point, we've got a carbocation actually on our aromatic ring, all right? Um, now, in that, 
we've got all this electron density that can move around this aromatic ring, okay? Because uh, of that, what was the aromatic ring, the way that electro the electronics of the aromatic ring, we now can move these electrons around that ring. So what that means is we've got multiple resonance structures that can occur <coughs> as a result of the carbocation reacting with, or the aromatic ring reacting with our carbocation. So if we move our electron density, so if we say this moves here, then we end up with this resonance structure. Okay, and we still have our photon here, all right? So here's another resonance structure. We can then move that electron density again. So if we say we move this direction, <coughs> then we've got um, multiple places where that carbocation kind of resonates around that aromatic ring to help support the carbocation, okay? Um, so the number of resonance structures that we can draw is important because just like with anything else, the more resonance structures you have, the more you stabilize that intermediate, all right? So just, just keep this idea in mind for when we show the reaction you guys are going to be doing, okay? Now, what happens is we then eventually get our AlCl4 minus to deprotonate our aromatic ring here. Well, it's not, not currently aromatic. Deprotonate our ring, and that reestablishes the aromaticity within the aromatic ring again. Okay? And so what you get out of this process is you're going to get HCl, um, you're going to get aluminum chloride back. So we, that's why we can call this our Lewis acid catalyst because all, we'll get our Lewis acid back at the end of the reaction, all right? So now let's look at, we'll look at the reaction you guys are going to do, okay? And then we'll talk about features of that reaction. So we are going to use, our aromatic ring is going to be toluene. It's going to be one of the reactants. It's also going to be a, uh, the aromatic substituent for the reaction. It's going to be where um, the reaction takes place. It's also going to be, sorry, our solvent, okay? So it's a reactant and it's going to be your solvent for the reaction. So it plays two roles um, for this reaction. We are going to look at the um, reaction of toluene with one bromopropane and two bromopropane, okay? And so, let's look at one bromopropane first. All right? Now, it can end up adding anywhere on this ring. All right, so the possible products that we could form is most likely not going to add where the methyl group is, okay? So there's five other places that it could potentially add on the, on the aromatic ring, all right? Just due to sterics, you're probably not going to have a big on chain add to, to here. You also would, you wouldn't be aromatic anymore if you add here, right? Because we only have five reactive spots, okay? Um, one of the spots is the ortho position, okay? And so what we define as ortho is the position directly next to whatever that substituent is, okay? So I'm gonna draw it here, but it could equally be over here, right? We've got two ortho positions, okay? And so when we add ortho, we call that 
One, two, addition. Okay, one, two. All right, or one, two. And we're counting our carbons on our aromatic ring. Another possibility would be we add to the carbon opposite where that substituent is. So we could add para to it. We only have one position that is para. Okay. Para is our one four. Then we could add to the third, so one, two, three spots over, is our meta position. And it could add here or it could have here. Either one is a meta position. All right? So that's just adding our one bromopropane to our toluene. These are the three products that we could form. And you will potentially see all three products, all right? With two bromopropane, so <coughs> it's basically the isopropyl equivalent, okay? We can get isopropyl products. So our ortho product. Three possible products. We did. That addition. Right. Everyone good with, with that so far? Okay. It's just a matter of where, where you can add on that alkyl group. Okay. Now There are products that we call um, kinetic versus thermodynamic products, okay? So when we define things that happen kinetically, what does that usually mean? What, what is formed immediately, right? So it doesn't equilibrate, it's the product that is, is formed immediately, okay? Um, for these type of additions, we typically think of our ortho and para additions as being the kinetic products, okay? So this guy and this guy, we typically think of as being kinetic, and that's what McMurray will, will talk about is the kinetic products, okay? Now with a thermodynamic product, what happens with that? It's usually, so it's not usually what happens right away, right? It's usually what you equilibrate to is the thermodynamic product, right? Okay? And so typically we'll talk about as the meta as the thermodynamic product, okay? This is what McMurray addresses as kinetic products. Thermodynamic, you can't tell until you actually run one, run the reaction to see what something equilibrates. And usually you're adding heat to the system to help it get to that thermodynamic product, okay? So usually warmer things you'll see more, colder things you'll see less <coughs> thermodynamic products because you added energy to overcome that energy barrier, okay? Yeah? Can you not just tell by the structure which one would be the thermodynamic? Not necessarily. No. There's a lot. You'll find out there's a lot of things that come into play with it. Yeah? Will we ever actually see the one bromopropane products? Will we just see a hydride shift? Well, that's what I'm going to get to. You actually will see the one bromo. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's part of what you're going to, to look at. So but I want to make sure everyone's good here before I jump, jump on to that possibility. Okay? All right, so 
the methyl group on the toluene is important, okay? So before we get to hydride shift, let's, we'll talk about this, this system here, all right? Um, this is a table from McMurray, and as you talk about um, aromatic chemistry, you're going to talk about things, in, um, substituents in terms of being meta-deactivators, ortho and para um, directing deactivators and ortho and para directing activators. The methyl group is known as an ortho and para directing activator, okay? And that is because the methyl group um, actually has some electron density that it can help contribute to the aromatic ring to help stabilize um, that carbocation intermediate, okay? Um, so I'm not going to go through this table in great detail because there's a lot involved in this and you guys are going to talk about it in, in more detail in lecture, okay? The important part for us is where that methyl group forms. It's known as an ortho and para directing activator, okay? And so to see how that comes into play, we're going to look at the possible resonance structures of adding ortho versus mera, meta versus para, okay? So if we added, and this, this is drawn for isopropyl, but it can be drawn for um, propyl, toly, um, adding the propyl group as well, okay? It doesn't matter that this is the isopropyl carbocation, all right? Either carbocation will work for these instances, okay? So if we look at just just um, the ortho substitution, these are the three resonance structures that you can draw from adding that carbocation, okay? So similar to what, what I showed um, over on the board. The key to these three resonance structures is there is one resonance structure where that carbocation is on the carbon where that methyl group is. And that methyl group has a little bit of electron density that it can help contribute to stabilize that carbocation, okay? So that's why the ortho subs um, substitution is considered a kinetic substitution, okay? Same with if you look at para, here's the um, resonance structures that can be drawn from adding para to the methyl group, and again, we've got one resonance structure where that carbocation is on the same carbon as the methyl group, okay? With the meta substitution, that is not the case when you draw the resonance structures. Okay? And so this is how that um, ortho para activating effect comes into play and why that is important for setting up the kinetic versus thermodynamic products. Okay? And why we say kinetically ortho and para would be the favorite products. Everyone good, good with that? Okay. All right. Now let's get to looking at hydride shifts because that adds an element of um, new possibility to what could happen. Okay. this carbocation, okay, so the primary carbocation. Just like we, we talked about in um, looking at the formation of alkenes, in this case we can have a hydride shift. The hydride shift could move where that carbocation is, okay? Does everyone see, see how that could happen? All right, so if we draw it like this instead. shift this direction, carbocation moves over here. Then from one bromopropane, we could form that carbocation. All right. 
And so that is a possibility, this carbocation rearrangement of the alkyl bromide can take place. Okay? <coughs> so when you add um, one bromopropane to toluene, what are all the possibilities of products that you can have them? <coughs> Is it three or is it six? Six. All of these are a possibility with one bromopropane. Okay. So we've now just added the complexity up a little bit. Okay. Um, this <coughs> is also something that you can look at as kinetic versus thermodynamic. Okay. Kinetically. This would be the carbocation that would add, right? It doesn't have time to equilibrate, um, and it just adds directly to the toluene, okay? Versus if the carbocation can equilibrate, it'll equilibrate to the secondary carbocation, okay? If it gets complicated looking at it, kin kinetic versus thermodynamic here versus kinetic versus thermodynamic here, think about this as a carbocation rearrangement versus the kinetic versus thermodynamic property of products that can be forming from the addition, from the alkylation. Okay? All right. So in order to look at this, you know, what should have been, you know, just simple old reaction here, what's going to happen with the reaction, we need to look at multiple different sets of reaction conditions to figure out what's actually going on with this reaction. So you guys are going to divvy yourselves up so that you can achieve that, that goal. Okay, so not you're not all going to run the reaction under the same conditions. There's going to be four different sets of conditions that are going to be used. And we're going to in lab tell you what set of reaction conditions you're you're going to be looking at. Okay. So <coughs> This is, I'm defining the reaction conditions exactly as the way they are defined in your lab manual. So you want to define things as A, B, C, D, keep that A, B, C, D consistent, okay? Because otherwise, if we're not, we're not talking the same language when we're talking about looking at these reactions, right? So condition A from your lab manual, we are going to do the reaction at zero degrees, okay? So that means you're going to do the reaction in an ice bath. You're going to use one bromopropane as your alkyl bromide. And you're going to then be able to form, potentially, all of the substituents here. Let's draw it. I'm going to draw it this way because otherwise it'll get too confusing. So we can add on ortho, para, meta our propyl group, right? Or we can add on ortho, para, meta, the isopropyl group. Okay? So six possibilities. The six possibilities we've already talked about over here. All right? Because we're starting with one bromopropane. So because we're starting with one bromopropane, we can add carbocation rearrangement, which is going to listen. Um, get us to potentially having six different products that we form. All right. Okay, B, we're going to use reflux and one bromopropane. So again, we can have our six different possibilities of compounds. And we're good so far. Okay. C, you're going to do zero degrees again. This time you're going to use two bromopropane. And so your, your products, potentially, based on what we've talked about so far, should be just three products, ortho, para, and meta isopropyl. Okay? Because this, this the secondary carbocation Typically, you're not usually going to see secondary carbocations. A lot of times, you want to rearrange to a primary carbocation, right? So you're not going to want to form the propyl products. You'll just want the isopropyl products. 
Um, for the reflux one, are you gonna get like all six options? Is that okay? So I, there wasn't any difference between how you work with possible products for A and B, so that you know they're all a possibility. Even at zero degrees, you can still get the mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's all possible. Whether you get that or not, you'll analyze your data and see that. But it is all possible. Okay. All right. So D is reflux of isopropyl or two-bromo, two and again, here's our possible products, okay? So when we give you a reaction condition in lab this week and we tell you that your reaction condition B, that means you're going to be starting with one bromo <coughs> propane and toluene adding together, okay? And you're going to do. You're going to end up heating your reaction eventually. All right. Um, so how are we supposed to set up our pre lab? I thought we were supposed to do it for our specific reaction. It doesn't. I'll get into that in a little bit, but it doesn't actually matter okay. because of the only things that are going to vary are your starting propyl group, and you should have both in there anyway because eventually you're writing a report for all of this. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's gonna. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm breaking it down slow because it is. It is. You gotta digest it in baby baby pieces here. Okay. Um. Okay. So we're good. Good here, right? What all this means. Okay. All right. So a couple things as far as here. Let's look at. Let's look at our setup first of all for for the reaction, right? Okay, so everyone is going to use the same apparatus, whether you're heating, heating a reflex or you're staying at zero degrees, okay? You're gonna start with your 250 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. You're going to be on your stir plate, okay? Everybody's using their stir plate. If you are doing this reaction in an ice bath, you're just gonna have your pan of ice around your flask. If you're doing this reaction at reflux, you're going to start with hot plate off, okay, you don't start heating um, until um, we get to a certain point along the way here, um, but you're going to have your flask directly on the stir hot plate, all right? Um, things that are kind of important to the setup, okay? First of all, we want our flask sitting flat on our stir plate, that will help with the stirring. We want our stir bar in the flask. Clamp your Erlenmeyer flask so it doesn't walk right off your stir plate. You want to, you're going to use rubber tubing to connect from your flask to what we're going to make here is an acid trap, okay? Because we're going to generate HCl um, through the process of this reaction, so we need to trap it, all right? Um, you're going to want to put a dip here is not shown in your lab manual very well, but you want a dip in that tubing, okay? The reason for that is we don't want any of the muck from the black tubing going back into your reaction during the process because you're gonna analyze all of this by GC. And remember, GC is pretty sensitive, okay? If you get black muck in your reaction, your peak table list, so that first page that you got from experiment eight and 11, you're gonna get the same sort of data this time. It will be multiple pages, okay? So you don't want the tubing in your reaction because it'll make the analysis far more complex, okay? So put a little dip here. You can even hold that dip down um, on the tubing with your clamp, okay? You clamp here because you want it also to go up. And then you want to hold it above the water very steadily, okay, so that it's just a millimeter of that funnel is in this beaker of water, okay? You don't want it submerged in the water because then you could create, as the process of the reaction goes on, you could actually create a vacuum and suck water into your reaction, and that'll be a problem, okay? Um, so you want to be very careful in setting this up. We'll go around and check your, your setup as you set it, set it up as well, okay? And this, this is in your lab manual, all right? Everybody is going to add um, 
You're going to add your toluene, add your bromopropane. Um, if you're in an ice bath, you'll just have an ice bath around here, okay? You will add the aluminum chloride, which I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute. Um, you're going to have a vial of aluminum chloride. You're going to add it in five portions slowly to your reaction. So at zero degrees, it'll be in the ice bath. If you're refluxing, you have not turned on the heat yet. It's just at room temperature, okay? Add your aluminum chloride slowly, all right? For the ice bath people, you will just keep your reaction in the ice bath after you've added the aluminum chloride. For the people heating your reaction, after you've added the aluminum chloride, given it a couple minutes to let it react, okay? So you don't want to just get your five doses in slowly and then all of a sudden crank the heat. Let, let things take place, react a little bit. Give it a couple minutes. Then you're going to very gently add heat to your flask, okay? And what I mean by gently is like low setting on your hot plate, one to two maybe if it has numbers instead of low, but very, very low minimal heating, okay? It's not going to take a lot to get this reaction mixture heated to where you need it to, and it doesn't take much heat to get it refluxing so much that it refluxes into the tube and then comes back into your reaction and brings the tubing muck with it, all right? So you want minimal, you know, low heating, not, not crazy, crank it to 10 and, and get it refluxing, okay? You're going to want, for the people heating it, you're going to want to put um, a piece of paper towel around the base here of your Erlenmeyer flask. That's your condenser, okay? So what you want to see is some, some um, rising and condensing of the solvent kind of in this area. What you don't want to see is rising and condensing of the solvent up by the arm of the flask, because that's going to spell trouble, okay? Then it's going to spill over the arm into the tubing, okay? So just gentle enough heating, we get a little rising, condensing of the vapor. Um, that will be good enough for you to see the differences in your data, okay? Heating versus not, okay? Everyone good, good with the setup, okay? Um, Things to remember, you, this is an acid trap. So when you set this up, don't set up your reaction right here by your, where you're standing, okay? You want things pushed to the back of the hood to help carry that acid away from you, okay? Um, also, when you go to dismantle this, remember it's now acidic water. It's not just water, okay? So be careful with that. Um, when you go to take this apart, be really careful, with, especially for the people that have heated, but even the people that haven't, to pull it apart such that you keep whatever muck is in here flowing this direction, not back into your reaction class, okay? The other thing with this tubing is you want to start with dry tubing. So if you've got, if there's residual water in the tubing you're going to use, dry it out. When you are done, you want to kind of clean out the tubing and then dry it out for the next person that's going to use use your area, okay? But be, be really careful with the setup, okay? Now, the aluminum chloride reacts with moisture really easily, okay? So it reacts with moisture from the air easily. It also reacts easily with the moisture from like your mucous membranes in your body, okay? So you want to be careful with the aluminum chloride, all right? First of all, it's in a vial. You're going to keep it capped when you're not adding it to your reaction, okay? So it doesn't react with the moisture in the air. But also make sure um, not do not inhale any of the dust, okay? Because then it'll be reacting with your, the moisture in your body, okay? And you will feel it, it will irritate you, it will burn, okay? So keep it in the hood, make sure you keep the hood sash between you and your reaction, keep it as low as possible so that it's not going, you're not, there's not any chance of that going into your body, all right? I'd wear gloves because you are generating acid when you're handling all this. Also, any dust on your hand, you're going to feel it. It'll start irritating after a little bit, okay? So be really careful with the aluminum chloride. Keep it capped. Keep it in the hood. Don't 
don't inhale any of it. Um, that's also why we have already weighed it out for you, okay? So it's um, in vials. What you're going to do is you're going to um, collect the mass of vial cap and the aluminum chloride when you first get that vial, okay? Then you're going to, when you are all done adding the aluminum chloride, you're going to collect the mass of the vial, the empty vial, and the cap, all right? That is how you're going to figure out how much aluminum chloride you actually transfer to your reaction. They are about a gram in, in those vials, but you do need to weigh out how much aluminum chloride was used, okay? So get the mass a vial cap and aluminum chloride beforehand, mass of vial and cap afterwards to get your, um, then do the calculation to get your aluminum chloride, okay? When you're done with these vials, there'll be a little bit of dust left in the vial. If you just take the vial and the cap and kind of have a beaker of water, let it submerge in the beaker of water, it'll kind of hiss at you a little bit, reacting the rest of the aluminum chloride, okay? But it'll kill the rest of the aluminum chloride. Then you can rinse it out with water, rinse it out with acetone, both, both the vial and the cap. And then there's a box in the reagent hood, that's where you're getting these vials from. Put the empties at the back of the box when you're all done and rinsed it out and dried it out, okay? Um, for the workup of this reaction, make sure you follow directions very carefully for um, reflux versus cold temperature. Um, for the reflux reaction, make sure you've cooled it all the way down to room temperature before you start working up the reaction, okay? You don't want to be adding, the first thing you're going to do is quench the reaction with water and acid. You don't want to quench the reaction with water and acid at reflux. Cool it all the way down to room temperature before you start quenching the reaction. And it is important that you get um, the water, ice water, you want cold water going into that reaction before you put the concentrated HCl in there. Wear gloves with, with the HCl, okay? Um, it is going to react, so keep that acid trap connected while you're quenching the reaction and, and do it kind of slowly. Don't just chuck all the water and, and chuck the acid in because you're gonna get thing, any aluminum chloride that's left is going to want to react really vigorously with that, okay? So be careful in starting the workup. Then you're going to um, be separating layers and then washing the organic layer. Sometimes what can form is what's called an emulsion. And what happens, instead of having two layers in your sub funnel, So normally we'd have two layers, right? Layer here, and here's the bottom of the side funnel. Layer here, layer here, okay? What you get is kind of this third layer in between where the two layers don't separate really well. And water and toluene don't like to separate super well, okay? So sometimes you get this emulsion layer. If you get where you don't have a good separation between your aqueous layer and your organic layer, there's sodium chloride solution in the reagent hood your lab manual gives you instructions for what to do with it. You actually you add that to your separatory funnel and shake and vent things a little bit and that should help the separation, okay? What you don't want to do is you're going to do the quenching of the reaction in your reaction flask. So you should be stirring still while you're quenching the reaction. When you add things to the separatory funnel, don't shake and vent them really super vigorously because you'll have a better chance of getting this emulsion if you vigorously shake and vent versus just shake and vent it a little bit and go, bit, go off of the stirring that you've already done to be the reaction that quenched the reaction, okay? After you drain the aqueous layer and taken care of it, if you have an emulsion, you're gonna have the organic layer that you have to wash with water. If you had to use sodium chloride the first time, 
you should probably use sodium chloride for that wash instead of sodium chloride solution instead of just water. Um, then you're going to dry with magnesium sulfate. We don't want to change the composition of the toluene in your reaction mixture. Um, we want to be able to weigh your reaction mixture after you've done, you're done drying it, and you're going to use GC data to figure out how much of it is still toluene versus how much of it is alkylated product, okay? We don't want to change that ratio by you adding more toluene to your reaction mixture, okay? So when you go to dry with magnesium sulfate, make sure you use only what you need, so a little bit of clumping with a little bit of free floating, and then when you go to filter the magnesium sulfate, kind of like you did with the alkene, you're not going to rinse it with anything. You're not going to use more toluene to rinse it, all right? You're just going to filter your um, organic layer away from the magnesium sulfate and then get the mass of that entire organic layer, okay? So make sure you get that mass first. So first you want this. This will be used to calculate um, your yield, and you'll use your GC data for that. The next thing you need is you're going to prepare a GC sample, and it's really important that there's no visible signs of water and no solid present in that GC sample, right? So um, look at your organic layer. Make sure it looks dry. Make sure it looks like there's no solid. If there either your, it still looks wet, we'll dry it again. If it looks like they're still solid, we'll filter it again, okay? Um, for the GC sample, you're gonna use one to two drops of that organic layer because it's, um, you know, it's more dilute than it was of just your pure alkene or your alcohol. You can use a couple drops of that organic layer. And then again, your, um, filling the vial with pentane, just like you did with um, experiment 811. One thing that's a little bit different is when I'm running these GC samples, I need to know what reaction conditions you use for your reaction. So when you label your vial, use your initials and then use page number where you record prepping it, and then what are your reaction conditions? So you should put a letter after it, okay? So initials, page number, and then the reaction condition letter should go after um, after that number for your GC sample, okay? And same as before, there's sample holders in lab, you put them in, There's also, and then you'll also label your bio, okay? And eventually, your lab props will tell you how this is gonna happen. Eventually, you will get GC data for, from all four reaction conditions. So you'll get yours plus three other people's GC data that you're gonna end up with, all right? Okay, so back to pre-lab. To help you out, the extra that you would have to look up by not knowing your reaction condition is the information for the bromopropane. So, um, <clears throat> one bromo propane molecular weight is 123 grams per mole. The density is 1.353 grams per milliliter. And its boiling point is 71 degrees. Two bromo propane. Same molecular weight, density is a little bit different, 1.31 grams per milliliter, and the boiling point is 59.4 degrees C. Okay. So now everything else for the reaction or for setting up your free lab is, is going to be the same regardless of what reaction conditions you've got. So the, you're going to write a 
pre-lab for all possibilities of what could happen with this, this reaction, all right? You need that anyway to write up your report. Um, so I said I'd mention final words about the um, practice exam. So make sure you get a copy of the practice exam. Do the practice exam over the next week. Next week in lab lecture, we'll talk about this data analysis and we'll talk about the practice exam. We'll go over it. The best way for you to know what you know and what you don't know on that practice exam is to take the exam this week on your own. Don't come to lab or come to lab lecture and then go through it and say, oh yeah, I know that, I know that, I know that. Because it's easier once you hear the answer to think you know what you know what's going on. Okay, so do the exam over the next week.